I'm Susan Welch, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here today for the second uh, Malvin and Leah Bank lecture. Um, I'm excited to introduce our speaker, but before doing that, I'd like to say something about Mal and Leah Bank and why they established this award. Mal Bank is a 1952 Penn State graduate with a degree in arts and letters with honors. After serving in the Korean War, he graduated from Yale Law School and then joined Thompson Hine Law Firm in Cleveland, where he had a very distinguished career specializing in taxes and estate planning. His wife, Leah, earned an associate degree from Penn State, uh, raised a family, and served as a volunteer in the community. So during his time at Penn State, Mal was particularly moved by the wonderful teaching of Kent Forster, who is a professor emeritus in history. Uh, he took every course that Kent offered, uh, whether or not he was interested in the topic a priori, he was inspired to learn by Professor Forster and gives him credit for making his education at Penn State really superb. I can say parenthetically that others had the same view of Kent Forster too, and many of our alums mention uh, his wonderful teaching. So by establishing this teaching award, Mal and Leah want to encourage other liberal arts faculty to be great teachers. So as part of the award, the winning faculty member is to give a public lecture on teaching. So now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, our second Mal and Leah Bank outstanding professor, Maria Trulio. Maria is an associate professor of Italian and women's studies who began her Penn State career as a lecturer in 2001, was appointed an assistant professor in 2003, and promoted to associate professor in 2009. She teaches a variety of courses on Italian and Italian American culture and civilization and she teaches language courses in Italian. Her students' praise of her teaching is nearly universal, even though, of course, most of her courses are in Italian. She's a passionate advocate for literature, for the Italian language, for her students. She inspires her students and empowers them to speak and contribute in this new language they're learning. In addition to her outstanding teaching, Maria has a significant publication record and is currently working on a book on Italian, uh, Italian children's literature from unification to fascism. Maria has already been recognized for her teaching with the College Outstanding Teaching Award in 2010. Her department head observes that Maria was the best class that she had ever witnessed, and the student letters are full of enthusiasm for this wonderful teacher. So it's a pleasure to introduce her to you. Thanks, Susan. Okay. Is this on okay? Can you? Thank you so much, Susan, for that introduction. And first of all, of course, I want to thank Mr. and Mrs. Bank for their generous sponsorship of this award. Awards like this, I think, are really wonderful ways to celebrate the college as a whole, since we all learn from and are inspired by each other. And moments like this become a chance to reaffirm the centrality of our undergraduate teaching mission. I also want to thank Julie Ducius, my department head, for having nominated me, and to all the students and colleagues who wrote letters for me. I'm really grateful for the chance to participate in a conversation this afternoon about undergraduate teaching at Penn State. So I'm really grateful for all of you for being here. Okay, switch. Right, here we go. So I chose this sentiment from Gramsci as the epigraph for my talk today. All young people should be equal before culture. 
Now, of course, many of our students are adult learners, but I think whenever we are learning, we are young. So I think the idea applies to all of our students and all of us. Although she was physically quite petite, the nun who taught Latin in my all-girl Catholic high school managed to instill trepidation in all her students. Certainly, I still remember it, right? Certainly no great fan of modern innovations in pedagogy, she would have us stand next to our desks and recite noun declensions and verb conjugations to the rapid rhythm of her yardstick tapping on the floor. I still hear it. Whenever any of us would appear lethargic, distracted, or unfocused as we struggled through our translations of Cicero, she would remind us in her ever vigorous tone that the Latin root of the word student comes from the verb meaning to be eager or zealous. Now as a teacher, while I certainly do not wield a yardstick, I remember and continue to admire Sister Marie Christina's zeal for her subject, her energetic passion for the beauty and precision of Latin, her devotion to the mental discipline its study requires. She not only imparted, but also modeled that etymological lesson. As a teacher in the liberal arts, I believe that my role in the classroom is primarily to facilitate the student's development and to foster their eagerness to learn. In a sense, then, I try to create the best conditions I can for students to be protagonists in their own education. I really like the image that Italian children's writer Gianni Rodari has offered in this regard. Writing in 1973 about his vision of the role of the school teacher, he speaks of transforming the teacher into an animator rather than someone who transmits prepackaged knowledge as if it were a snack a day. Instead, the teacher is with the students in a collaborative enterprise of development. The syllabus, the lesson plans, the classroom environment, and the forms of assessment should all serve this goal. I'll talk today about each of these elements of teaching, and then we can open up to a discussion. But I do want to say now that in my general approach to teaching, and in many of the very specific activities and assessment forms which I use and I continue to modify, develop, and I hope improve, I have drawn on the models of my own teachers. I have learned from my many wonderful colleagues whose classes I have observed and who have generously shared their ideas and strategies over the years. And I've benefited from various teaching workshops and pedagogy seminars that Penn State organizes. To be certain, I think that the classroom should be a place of instruction that is, an arena to furnish students with information. To me, instruction is really just the necessary but insufficient first step of and toward education. I'm thinking here, in a recontextualized way, of course, of some other remarks by Antonio Gramsci from 1916. While Gramsci, in this passage, was reacting to the very specific situation of Italian high schools in the early 20th century, his sentiments, broadly speaking, inspire my understanding of our mission. I'm paraphrasing here and specifically substituting the word student where Gramsci uses child. Gramsci envisions, quote, a system in which the student is allowed to develop and mature. And that does not force the student's intelligence and growing awareness to run along tracks to a predetermined station. Students should have all possibilities open to them. Schools should not be allowed to become incubators of little monsters aridly trained for a job with no general ideas no general culture, no intellectual stimulation. Education helps a student to blossom into an adult so long as it is educative and not simply informative, not simply passing on techniques. So simply, I think of instruction as a step towards education or the process of drawing out from students their curiosity, insights, and potentials, which may then run along a multiplicity of tracks to unforeseen stations. One of the lessons I have learned over my years as a teacher, in fact, is that this step can't be stepped over. In other words, we cannot expect students to engage in those more abstract, critical, and theoretical levels of discussion and critique if they are not equipped with the tools they need. I have been reminded of that when intelligent and inquisitive students have had the courage to ask the questions that I'm sure were in the minds of many students. For example, a student in my women's writer course once asked me during a class, Maria, you keep using the word fascism. What is that? And similarly, a student in another class asked, Maria, you've been talking about these socialists, but what exactly is socialism? These students have helped me work on the process of laying appropriate groundwork, reviewing core concepts, and providing the kinds of framework within which we can then collaboratively explore and examine the big questions. 
So very broadly then, I think of my role as an animator in order to move collaboratively with the students through instruction to education. Specifically, as a teacher of Italian language, literature, and culture, I strive to help my students develop fundamental skills, such as clear writing and language fluency, to introduce them to the complexity and depth of a cultural tradition often portrayed in American media by superficial stereotypes, and to provide them with a new perspective with which they can reevaluate their own surroundings and experiences. So my remarks today come from my experiences in teaching, conducting classes in Italian and in English to groups of about 10 to 50 students at all levels. I hope that after the presentation, we can talk more about other strategies and challenges for other kinds of classroom environments. So one of the challenges and, teaching of, challenges and pleasures of teaching a foreign literature is to convey its historical specificity and uniqueness, while at the same time encouraging students to find ways in which these texts can illuminate questions of relevance to them. In this regard, one of the most challenging and rewarding courses I teach is Italian women writers. The first step in teaching this course for me was to explain and to justify to myself and to the students why we would have such a course at all. This need to articulate pedagogical goals and to justify the organizing concept for a course is true for all classes, but I felt it especially pressing here in that the very design of the course, separating off women writers as a category, potentially ran the risk of doing the opposite of my intention. The course description on the syllabus therefore became a particularly crucial text, and we touch back on it at various points through the semester. So I have it up there on the screen um, to read some of it. Italian women have often been stereotyped as mamas who cook, pray, and idolize their sons, or as sultry objects of male sexual desire. As writer and actress Franca Rame put it, all home, bed, and church. Such images do not accommodate the wide variety of experiences and contributions of Italian women throughout history. So then I go on to talk about the goals of the seminar, the kinds of texts that we look at, the specific kinds of questions that we will pose to each of the texts, and then I try to conclude with some very concrete but open-ended goals for the class so that the students can touch back on this during the semester as we go um, from text to text. So with these parameters and goals in mind, early in the semester, we read Sibylla Alaramo's Watershed 1906 autobiography called A Woman. The narrator protagonist of this book, while still a teenager, marries the man who raped her and lives for many years with his continuing physical and emotional abuse. Students at times express their frustration at what they consider the passivity of the protagonist and register their annoyance at her reluctance to leave this man, their surprise at the fact that she married him at all, or their impatience with, with what they term her complaints or even her whining. It has been difficult for me at these moments not to correct or even scold these students for what to my mind may bespeak a certain lack of empathy. And I would actually be eager to hear how other teachers navigate such delicate moments in class discussions. But I've tried to use those kinds of reactions to bring in the instruction part of education. In this case, I review and expand on the very significant legal, religious, and cultural differences between early 20th century Southern Italy and early 21st century America. Divorce was not legal. The husband, of course, had ownership of the children and so forth. This allows us to think about ways our cultural norms inform our personal choices. I also encourage the students to look at how, that is, through what specific rhetorical and narrative strategies the text may in fact be eliciting the very reaction of impatience and frustration in the readers. In particular, students always have a great deal of insight and, and creative reactions concerning the effects of the novel's total lack of any proper names for any of the characters through the whole book. This is typically the first topic that we analyze as a group when looking at this novel. We also look at the frequent use of ellipses as the narrative voice leaves certain thoughts unspoken. And we look at the scene in which the narrator describes the unreceptive reaction of the Roman audience to a performance of Ibsen's A Dollhouse. Ultimately, in fact, one aim of the novel was precisely to justify why the protagonist does, after much torment, leave her husband and her son. It is, in fact, on the last pages, addressed directly to her abandoned son. 
I encourage the students to use the classroom as a safe and supportive space where they can share their initial reactions to the novel and collaboratively brainstorm how the text may have conditioned those reactions, and then use their written papers for a more rigorously argued and carefully thought through interpretation. The papers they submit, in fact, are always a more nuanced, historically grounded reading. In the most recent semester teaching this course, I included for the first time Franca Rame's 1979 monologue, Lo Stupro, or The Rape. Here, the actress, playwright, and comedian, Franca Rame, reenacts her real-life abduction and gang rape by a group of neo-fascists in 1973. I wanted us to watch the video clip of her televised performance together as a class because the performance itself took place in a public venue, and that format indeed contributed to the effects of her monologue. We, as an audience, sit collectively and, in a sense, witness this rape. However, I was concerned about the intensity of the material. I put on our angel site the text of the monologue and let students know ahead of time that the video was potentially very upsetting. This is really the only trigger alert I have ever given as a teacher. The practice of warning students in advance of potentially traumatic material like this and allowing them the option of not participating I know is a very sensitive issue and one that has been much discussed in online forums and in other venues. And perhaps we want to take up that discussion later today. To be honest, I'm not sure that I went about it in the best way on this occasion. In essence, I announced to the students that they should read the monologue before class and that they would be excused from the session in which we'd watch the clip if they felt that was necessary. The class when we screened the clip was in fact fully attended, but I think perhaps there might have been better ways of handling this. Chris also suggested that I talk today about occasions in which things go wrong. <laughs> So in fact, as it turned out, in screening this clip, the technology failed me and we had no sound. So, you know, right? So I made some attempts to figure it out, but those of you who know me know that that was a lost cause before it even began. And I didn't want to lose too much class time fussing at the podium. So the students did have the transcript, and in fact, the muted video turned out to be actually a really effective exercise. Without the sound, we were all very focused on the visual aspects of the performance, the lighting, the body language, the staging, and the props. And in the discussion that followed, the students pulled together really amazing connections between the script and the performance. These kinds of difficult moments when, for example, students react in ways that we do not anticipate are, I think, to some degree, an effect of the challenge of taking ourselves out of the position of maintaining total control. To draw again from Johnny Rodari in his text, The Grammar of Fantasy, he notes that his suggestions and strategies for eliciting creativity in children are, quote, not recipes, but rather they constitute a new position, a different role. And it is understandable that at this point, innumerable problems confront these teachers, demanding to be resolved once more. But between a school that is dead and one that is alive, there is a true mark of distinction. The school for consumers is dead. Pretending to be alive, it cannot avoid putrefaction. A school that is alive and new can only be a school of creators. This means that there is no such thing as students or teachers, but whole individuals. To attempt to reach the goal of collaborating with creators rather than merely supplying consumers it is indispensable, I think, to engage the various learning styles of individual students. Having taught preschool many years ago has actually helped me, not because our students are children or childish, but because the basic strategy of moving from concrete to abstract and of trying when possible and appropriate to engage all the senses can be effectively applied at the university level too. I'll share now some activities that I really love using in my classes, again, not as recipes, but as examples of some approaches that might be useful in other contexts. In general, of course, frequent use of the chalkboard and whenever possible having the students themselves write on the board, video clips and PowerPoints enhance the classroom experience visually. Activities that require motion, like having students perform skits or learn vocabulary through charades or win, lose, or draw, overcome the potential passivity of lecture format. Visual and tactile exercises and strategies can be as simple as bringing in props. 
I found this really helpful in my lessons on Luigi Capuana's 19th century fairy tales. Although written for children and in standard Italian, not in his Sicilian dialect, the language is still a bit challenging. And unfortunately, given the magical milieu of the stories, students can't always rely on the strategy of using common sense to understand the more complicated parts when they stumble on a language barrier. So I bring in objects to act out visually some of the scenes. For example, when we are reading a fairy tale called The Three Rings, I toss a large walnut on the floor and stomp on it, imitating the evil princess in the story. I love that part. After crushing the walnut, I gasp and yelp to enact the ungrateful princess's horrible realization that this odd gift, the walnut, contained a baby inside sent from her sister. Similarly, when we were reading Capuana's tale, The Needle, I bring in a sewing needle and act out the punishment inflicted on the evil queen and show the students how this enchanted object, after stitching the jealous queen's gown ever more tightly around her legs, ends up stitching the queen's clothing directly into her skin as she shrieks and begs for mercy from the humble servant girl. There's a lot of screaming that week in class. Right? Once they have a clearer visual image of these moments in the plots, we can move to an, into a discussion of, for example, how these 19th century fairy tales differ from ones with which we are more familiar from our own childhoods, and what may account for the depiction of scenes that we may consider excessively and inappropriately violent for a juvenile reading public. Later in the semester, we read a children's novel from the 1920s that uses a long pearl necklace as a literalized metaphor for a person's lifespan, with each pearl representing an hour. I bring in a plastic bead necklace to pass around for each student to hold as we talk about how this image works. In these cases, the use of objects themselves becomes a topic for discussion. What is the role or the effect of the enchanted quotidian objects like needles or walnuts in almost all fairy tales? What is or is not effective about an everyday object like a necklace serving as a metaphor for an abstract concept like time in a children's book? In other exercises, I try to use the visual and tactile material in a way that enables students to take center stage. Some of the exercises I'll talk about literally and physically marginalize me. I end up on the periphery of the room and occasionally intervene as the students undertake projects, debates, and other activities. In my 20th century literature course, for example, I break the class into pairs and supply each with paper and colored pencils. Only one member of the pair can see the screen in front of the room onto which I project an image such as Giorgio de Chirico's 1914 metaphysical painting Canto d'Amore, or Song of Love. In my 19th century class, we do a sa the same exercise using Liberty Leading the People. The students who can see the image must describe the painting in Italian to their partners, and the partners attempt to reproduce it with their backs to the screen. As they are describing and drawing, I circulate around to help with necessary vocabulary. Typically, I do not hear anyone resorting to English, and the students who are drawing are not, not using their Italian, but rather they are asking their partners in Italian for clarification, elaboration, or confirmation that they have understood. Once they have completed the drawings, we compare their artwork to the original and take a moment to clarify any final points of confusion. With everyone facing the screen, I have the title, artist, and date of the painting on the board, and we open up a more analytic discussion of how the painting might engage social, technological, political, and aesthetic issues of its time and make links to the literature that we are reading. The students, having had plenty of time really to look at the painting and describe it, are better prepared to move to analysis than they would have been jumping in cold. Another exercise I love and I think works well for certain texts is to have the students role play, acting as the characters from, for example, Pinocchio, Dacia Marini's story, The Other Family, or Verdi's Rigoletto. The characters from these stories are guests on the Dr. Phil show, trying to work out their issues. To set up the activity, I ask a student to describe in Italian what goes on in the show, and a lot of them deny ever watching Dr. Phil. I don't believe it. They all, seem, they all seem to know what goes on. And then I have the students pick a name from a hat so that they are either a character to go on stage or an audience member. The role assignments are always random, so students don't feel that I am picking favorites or deliberately choosing the more linguistically advanced students for the major roles. 
I give them a couple of minutes to prepare an opening line of introduction if they are a character or a probing question if they are an audience member. So in these Italian classes, students are then compelled to use more complicated structures, but in a way that doesn't feel like a test. For example, for the protagonist of The Other Family, who is a woman with a husband and two sons in Milan and another husband and two sons in Rome, a student audience member asked, if you had to choose one husband, which one would you choose and why? And when we were doing this activity for Pinocchio, Pinocchio was asked by a student audience member, if you could relive your life, would you sell your spelling book to see the puppet show? The activity allows the students to take on a persona and to open up in a way that may, they may not do comfortably as themselves. And I remember one semester in particular, there was a very serious student who, in fact, because of his fluency, seemed almost to intimidate the other students in the class. And he ended up in the role of the Roman husband when we were doing The Other Family. And uh, on the stage as a character with Dr. Phil, he really opened up and was extremely funny and loose. And that really ended up sort of breaking the ice with the rest of the class. And the dynamic in the class actually got a lot better after that activity. Students who may be a bit shy take on the role of the finger-wagging talking cricket or the womanizing Duke of Mantua and start talking and interacting far more freely than in a normal discussion. The goal, of course, is to review the plot, to interrogate literally the characters, and to begin to think about themes and issues. I'm usually in the back of the room and will interject a question or follow up on an answer if there is a lull. We touch back on these interviews as we move on with more analysis. The role playing I described here is most effective when you're working with narratives that have particularly compelling characters. An exercise I like to use when I'm doing poetry is a game with index cards as a way to identify and understand how various rhetorical devices work. I like this because it helps students to under overcome their sense, and I say this only because I've had students tell this to me, that poetry is something they somehow don't get. So I've used this game in particular for early 19th century poets like Giacomo Leopardi. It's always so much fun, right? My Italian is still. Um, as preparation, we use a worksheet with definitions for devices like metaphor, metonymy, chiasmus, anaphora, and so forth, as well as some examples of each from songs, advertisements, or other popular media. Then we tackle the poem using this game to accumulate points. Students work in pairs or small groups, and they sit in a large circle. In the middle of the circle, on the floor, on a table, are scattered a bunch of index cards, and each one has the name of a device and a point value on the front, and a definition of the device on the back. Each team scours the poems to find examples of chiasmus and aphra and so forth. Once they find um, a use of a device in the poem, they can grab the corresponding index card with its points. When all the cards have been claimed, we stop the competition, and the teams must prove that their examples actually fit the definition of the rhetorical device in order to earn the points. Then we're ready to move to a conversation interpreting how these devices help to produce nuances and meaning. So whether I'm teaching in Italian or in English, using write-on overhead transparencies and colored pens for small group work and presentations always seems like a good way to enable some very creative and focused analysis. With students working in small groups, I give them a set of specific interpretive questions, always making sure that all the students in the class hear or see all the questions, no matter which subset they're working on and they get a blank transparency with colored pens. They're asked to use the sheet to write down keywords, relevant quotations, or images in any way they want as a visual aid. Each group then presents the results to the rest of the class. So I've seen students use the sheet to create a Venn diagram. For example, when they were asked to think about how a certain character might be an alter ego of the narrator, to make columns of pros and cons in a debate when they were assessing who was the most virtuous character in Machiavelli's The Mandrake Root, or in this example that I put up, to draw images that are in play in the text. And in this case, it was the fire or the flames from Giovanni Verga's story Nedda that link the opening frame to the main narrative. I've also used this in my Italian-American class um, on the novel um, by Pietro di Donato, Christ in Concrete. And Donato writes, in an English, but an English that's a little bit challenging and difficult. At times, he tries to imitate the sort of broken English of the Italian immigrants who aren't fluent. 
At other times, he actually writes in English that's a sort of literal one-to-one -one translation from Italian into English when he wants to signal that the characters are actually speaking in Italian. And so what I ask the students to do is go through the novel and pick any one sentence that's a little odd or clunky in that way, and to, on their transparency, write a translation into a more fluid, standard English. And then they come up in front of the class, and they talk about what was gained and what was lost in Di Donato's choosing to write in the way he did, rather than just saying that, how they put it into the sort of standard English uh, rendition of it. These exercises certainly have the qualities of games or at least of playfulness, and I absolutely do enjoy it when I see that the students are laughing and having fun. However, as the students are always fully aware, these games are intended to animate both creative and critical thinking. Again, I'm inspired by Gianni Rodari, who advocated the use of imagination in education, and who remarks rather poetically that, quote, every possible use of words should be made available to every single person, not because everyone should be an artist, but because no one should be a slave. No matter what kind of exercise we are doing in class, the more actively a student participates, the more meaningful the learning process becomes. And I believe that one of the most important tasks we have as a teacher is to listen. Engaged listening helps create an atmosphere of mutual respect by letting the students know they are being taken seriously. This is sometimes a bit of a struggle for me, partly because I like to talk. <laughs> But of course, I also want to come prepared with the information and the ideas I want to convey. And I always have at least one answer in my head to all the questions that I pose. But at times, I find myself having actively to suppress all those prepared ideas in my head and really hear what the students are saying. I remember, for example, discussing Luigi Pirandello's play Six Characters in Search of an Author with the students in my gen ed survey class on Italian culture. One student suggested that Pirandello's development of the idea of the mask was just like Julia Roberts' portrayal of the prostitute with a heart of gold in the American film Pretty Woman. My immediate reaction was to feel a certain disappointment, like I obviously hadn't explained things properly. But I tried, however, to respond instead by affirming the student's perception of a connection between two different time periods, cultures, and genres, and appreciating her insight into how the broad questions of identity metaphorical masks, appearances in reality, were indeed at play centrally in both texts. Then I also encouraged her to try to go beyond a reduction to the same and to consider the specific and different nuances that Pirandello brings to the questions of identity. My goal, and certainly not always achieved, is to foster a real class discussion rather than a sequence of student-teacher dialogues. To do this, I try to challenge students to refine their comments, and take them a step further, to connect their, their rem remarks and responses with ideas offered by other students. And in fact, the students themselves are always really good at this, usually prefacing their own remarks with a phrase like, to go off what she just said, or building on that, his comment, and so forth. And also to respond to the challenges that they pose to me, which sometimes means fully responding in the next class session. Right? And I've gotten less and less embarrassed with the phrase, I'll look into that and get back to you next time. And then I just have to remember to actually do that, right? So I want to address briefly, too, the opportunities that we have here for team teaching and collaborations. Particularly with support from the Institute for the Arts and Humanities, I've had a chance to co-teach two graduate seminars with my colleague from Spanish literature. Because we're focusing on undergrad teaching today, I won't say too much about these experiences, except to note that co-teaching, while not at all less work, is an enormously rewarding and stimulating experience because you get to be both a teacher and a student in terms of the material of the class. These projects are also great opportunities to get to know colleagues from other programs, to do um, guest speakers and so forth, and to really branch out and get to know our colleagues outside of our little, you know, I was, you know, Burroughs or Keller or wherever we are these days. Right? At the undergraduate level, and again through the institute, I was able to do a really rewarding collaboration with a colleague in the College of Arts and Architecture. It was not a co-taught class, but rather the students in my Italian children's literature class worked on a semester-long project with the students in her sculpture class. We organized the students into about eight groups with students from both classes in each group, and every group was assigned one of Capuana's fairy tales. Working together, the students translated the fairy tales into English, 
and then created a sculpture inspired by the tail. In this sculpture, based on the needle, which I talked about earlier, the students chose a particularly cruel phrase spoken by the poor tailor to his maimed daughter. Chi non abbraccia non dovrebbe aver bocca. Those without arms should not have a mouth. The phrase, issued in a proverbial type form, expresses his frustration at having to feed someone who cannot contribute to the family. The image that the students created does not illustrate a specific moment in the story. No one's mouth is ever sewn up in this story. But rather, their image mobilizes and combines a variety of images and motifs from Capuana's fairy tale and captures some of its tone to become an effective and powerful extension or even translation of the fairy tale. The semester culminated, as um, you might be able to read on the postcard, in an exhibit of all the sculptures at the downtown theater and with booklets of all the translations. In addition to team teaching and teaching collaboration, um, through grants offered by the Institute, for example, Penn State has a wealth of resources, both human and material, that enrich our students' classroom experiences. In one of my classes, for example, we benefited from a session hosted by the print curator at the Palmer Museum. He gave us a lesson in the print room of the museum, displaying and discussing European prints that exemplified realism, symbolism, futurism, and so forth. The lesson brought to life many of the concepts our class had been studying in Italian literature. The liaison librarians at Petit offer extremely useful and tailor-made research method sessions for all levels of undergraduates to help them identify and locate reliable and relevant sources for their projects. And I always find that when I do those research sessions, the papers that they end up producing at the end of the semester are so much better and really drawing on not Wikipedia, right? Um, and as well, the curator of special collections at Petit has hosted several sessions for my classes in which she displays rare books related to our syllabus, Renaissance editions of Boccaccio and Machiavelli, for example, and talks to the students about the history and materiality of the book. These kinds of activities are especially helpful in first-year seminars to introduce students to all the resources at Penn State, but can be excellent experiences at any level. So in addition to playing games and going on field trips, I do give my students homework. Um, because students express their thoughts most effectively in different ways, I try to vary the nature of the assignments to accommodate those different modes of expression. My classes usually require some combination of exams, analytic papers, creative writing, research papers, oral presentations, and group projects. A major change that I have made since my first year's teaching is in the design of my assignments. In contrast with the assignments from my first years, which tended to be very open-ended and somewhat vague, I think I provide much clearer and more focused rubrics and guidelines now. I do not think it is a hindrance to their creativity or their freedom, but rather gives them the confidence to express their ideas with the understanding of the goals of the project, that is, with a clearer grasp of what the assignment is aiming to achieve, evaluate, or encourage. One of my favorite um, papers to read is from my Italian-American course on Mario Puzo's novel, The Fortunate Pilgrim. Did I do that? There we go. OK. I asked the students to adopt the voice of one of the characters. We'll get back to Harlequin, don't worry. Taking on the persona of that character, they write a letter to another character in which they justify a decision, apologize for a wrong, and or express gratitude of some sort. So the students have to draw on specific details from the novel and implicitly analyze the text while doing so in a way that allows for their creativity. Most recently, students have used this format really fruitfully to make, in a creative way, an implicit argument about the text. And this is actually an assignment that was just handed in this week. For example, some of the most powerful papers this semester tackled the question of the violent death of one of the protagonists, Vincent. In interpreting whether his death was an accident or suicide, some students, like this one, wrote Vincent's suicide note, thus essentially mounting an argument for their interpretation of an ambiguous element in the novel. They undertook a character analysis and also framed this analysis, poignantly articulated in the character's voice, within the class's broader questions of the experience of being caught between two cultures and two often conflicting worldviews. Other students took on different characters' voices 
and through their letters expressed how the novel either celebrates or critiques the mythology of the American dream as the Italian-American family moves from their tenement in the New York City ghetto to their house on Long Island. In other classes, I ask students to create original work that is modeled on particular texts as a way to promote active engagement with the material. In my comedy class, for example, we studied the tradition of the Commedia dell'arte and looked at the famous masked characters, the old merchant Pantalone linked to Venice, the pedantic Dottore of Bologna, and so forth. As a quick in-class activity, I asked the students to create a Commedia dell'arte character for a US city and to sketch out the mask, costume, body language, and speech of that character and to decide whether the character would be a vecchio, an old man, one of the zanni, the zany servants like Harlequin, or perhaps an innamorato, a lover, depending on the image of the city that the character embodies. As a written assignment for this class, students rewrite a comedy from the syllabus as if a different author had written it. For example, they might decide to take Machiavelli's Renaissance the Mandrake route and rewrite it as late 20th century Marxist comedian Dario Fo might have written it. This expects students to think through not only the styles of the different authors, but also the effects of historical, economic, and social changes. Of course, I also regularly assign more traditional analysis and research papers because clear writing logical argumentation, and the ability to articulate and defend a thesis are, I think, core missions of our teaching. I aim to make these papers an opportunity for students to build on and extend class discussions. The midterm topic for my women's writers course yielded some very good papers, though I think next time I'll be more explicit in defining some of the terms at play. So I have that up there. I won't read it to you. But basically, I took a, a brief quotation from Judith Butler and paraphrased it and gave them sort of um, you know, three options to consider as they were looking at any one text or combination of texts in the course. So to conclude, I use forms of assessment as learning tools with the objectives named above as guiding principle. Papers, exams, and projects become a motivation for students to engage the material, an opportunity for them to develop their thinking and writing skills, and a form in which to reflect on the significance of the material beyond the confines of the classroom. Ultimately, I hope my students go on after leaving Penn State, continuing to be eager learners and creative contributors, just as I know that every semester I continue to learn from and be inspired by them. Thanks.